As I said, it's a good movie. I hope you uh, make time to see it. The depiction of life, you may want to have your notes in. The depiction of life in the gulags is on the gentle side. So that it is accessible to audiences who don't come from totalitarian societies. But you do get a sense of how things work. First of all, the guards the guards do what they are going to do, and there's not much you can do about it. But they're not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem are the other prisoners. Now, this is true in any prison. But in the gulags, and Orwell talks about this in 1984, actual criminals are in a much better position than political prisoners. Because actual criminals are victims of society, whereas political prisoners are enemies of society. It's also true that actual criminals are vicious, sneaky, dangerous. Whereas political prisoners tend to be idealists, people who stand on principle. So yet one more punishment that the political prisoner faces, the prisoner of conscience faces, is that the guards happily allow them to be victimized by whatever criminals are incarcerated with them. This is very much still the case in every um, gulag system around the world today. So going to prison isn't just a matter of losing your freedom and your autonomy, your ability to decide what you're going to do with yourself, your time, your life. It's not just living in uh, squalor, which you do. It's not just working like a dog until you expire, like in the mines where you go uh, night blind and then blind and then you die of poisoning. But it's that all along the way, you're going to have the most violent people, the most vicious people, at your heels or ripping into your flesh and your psyche every moment of every day. You can't escape them. There's nowhere to go. The guards won't stop them. The guards laugh because they think it's funny, and it is part of intentionally part of your punishment. So, the secret black market trade that goes on is also something that goes on in any prison system. People are not able to get everything that they could want in prison. And the most vicious and violent people are going to find ways to take from those people that are weaker than them. So if you have parcels that the guards go through and they take what they want, and then you trade, you're always trading. This is the ultimate free market. In a prison, you have no option but to trade for what you want. Trade skills, trade goods, trade services. And maybe, if you're smart and self-disciplined, you will trade to do a plan. Now, escape does happen. But in Siberia, escape is its own form of death sentence. Siberia is unimaginably huge. It's much larger than Canada. And Canada is unimaginably huge in terms of the wilderness area it has. The closest we have in this country is Alaska. You think that the wild areas of Idaho are big, and they are. They're about half the state. But compared to Alaska or Canada, and Siberia is much bigger than them. In the case of the German camps, uh, they're much more effect effectively guarded. But there are still escapes. But because the Germans tend to operate in more civilized areas, uh, they invest more energy and time and they tend to be more disciplined anyway than Russians. Uh, so getting away is harder. What is the purpose of this? 
The purpose of this is the last image in the novel 1984, or one of them. In terms of the future, imagine a boot pressing into a human face forever. That's totalitarianism. And part of that boot is the secret police that monitors thought, that monitors every sign of dissent, and that punishes without law. We are used to a society where you're not punished unless you're guilty of something. This is a society where you're punished because they decide to punish you. Maybe you're guilty, maybe you're not. In the course of the punishment, you have no right to a serious fair trial. You may be put on trial, you may be go going through a trial, but it's a show trial, like Vashinsky ran. A trial designed to do one, other th one thing and one thing only, not achieve justice, but gin up public uh, outrage against people like you. And the punishment is not anywhere proportionate to the crime. Also, totalitarians are pretty scrupulous about making yourself complicit in your own victimization by forcing you to sign a confession. The Chinese communists go further. They have you do regular journaling where you talk about your dreams and your subconscious and your thought crimes, and they have you go back through your past and analyze everything through the lens of Maoist thought. And every crime that you ever thought, crime defined by Mao, the party, is something that you bring up, that you ask to be punished for, that you ask to be cleansed of. That's the system. The idea of rehabilitative prison is ludicrous compared to something like this. They're not trying to rehabilitate. This is all about terror. And by making the Gulag Archipelago terrifying, everyone knows they are one moment away from the Gulag or from some torture chamber or, for, or, or from being executed. And in a world like that, can you be you? Can your personality blossom? Can an individual grow inside your human body? Or do you stunt and stymie yourself in order to protect yourself from punishment, in order to hide like a rodent from terror? All totalitarian societies do this. We simply are looking at the Russian uh, variant, which is particularly effective. In the end, the Soviet Union, which ideologically is opposed to fascism and national socialism, in fact, governs in the same way. That's why totalitarianism is the way I approach these things, because what they say it's all for is far less important than what they actually do. But in the end, and I'll tell you this story a little bit more when we do appeasement, the Soviet Union causes World War II by allying itself with Adolf Hitler in August of 1939 and invading Poland and a bunch of other Eastern European countries in the months following then Stalin is surprised when the Germans stab him in the back in June of 41. We'll talk more about that when we approach World War II. Next week, we do fascist Italy, Japan, and Nazi Germany. I believe we have a note. Uh, what's, Jack, can you look at the syllabus, please, and see what's due this coming Monday? Syllabus is on the board behind you. Look for European history, Euro... And that would be April 17th, 18th, 19th. Chapter Survey 29 is due.
And that's the last chapter survey you're going to have to do for me. 